Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bob Goodlatte. I'm chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, and uh, welcome to our hearing, which will start in just a moment. I want to thank all the members who've come from all over the country to participate in today's hearing, uh, especially the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Nadler. I apologize for having it a full eight blocks from his home. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, we're, we're glad to, to be here in New York, and it's a very exciting uh, week and weekend, and we hope you all enjoy that very much. I first especially want to thank uh, Fordham University and their law school for uh, hosting us for this hearing. And with that in mind, I want to uh, uh, ask uh, Dean Matthew Diller to uh, say a few words. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I wanted to welcome you and the entire committee and the distinguished uh, witnesses and all the members of the public uh, to our law school. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, at Fordham Law School, we're deeply interested in issues relating to intellectual property. We are, after all, the law school at Lincoln Center, and we are in the shadow of Lincoln Center. If these blinds were open, you'd be looking out at the Opera House. And so music is extremely important to all of us. I particularly want to welcome Representative Nadler, who is a distinguished alum of our school. Welcome back, Congressman. Um, and I want to wish you all well in your important business. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dean. And uh, with that, we'll get started. The Judiciary Committee will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. We welcome everyone to this afternoon's hearing on music policy issues, a perspective from those who make it. And I'll begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. Our nation's copyright laws and the exclusive rights they grant to artists and creators have made the United States the world leader in creativity. We must ensure that status continues in the digital age. It requires courage for individuals to take a risk and transform the ideas in their minds into works of art, musical works, literature, software, and other creative forms. Creators willing to do so expose themselves to criticism and rejection if others do not appreciate their efforts and they face theft if their work is appreciated. We must continue to provide our nation's creators with strong incentives to take these risks so that we can continue to reap the rich benefits our nation's creators provide to our citizens and nation and the rest of the world. Today we focus on music creators on a major weekend for the music world. The statutory framework that governs the music industry has long been the subject of a number of legitimate complaints that it fails to properly recognize and reward American music creators. Today's witnesses will highlight how the music business has changed over the past decade, resulting in a number of policy issues of concern. Most, if not all, of these policy issues are the subject of pending legislation. These issues include the distinction in copyright law between sound recordings fixed prior to February 15, 1972, and those fixed afterwards, the convoluted mechanical licensing system that seems to create more litigation and paperwork than actual royalties for songwriters, the ability for producers, sound engineers, and mixers to be paid for their efforts when their works are webcast, and the appropriate rate setting mechanisms for the uses of music that are subject to compulsory licenses. A number of interested parties have worked with the Judiciary Committee and its members to draft legislation to address these issues <coughs> and more. Most notably, in their order of introduction this year, the AMP Act, the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, the Classics Act, and the Music Modernization Act. I'm sure that the witnesses will have thoughts on all of these bills, which have been the subject of a number of recent letters of support across the music industry. Before I turn to our witness panel today, I would like to highlight the music industry's unique status as one of the last industries subject to federal rate setting mechanisms. It is an obvious and long-term question whether such over-regulation is truly necessary. 
Hopefully, the legislation pending before Congress currently will modernize the system while paving the way for a day when American music creators can do what virtually every other American creator is able to do, set their price for the usage of their creations. Now it is my pleasure to recognize our host member and the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by uh, stating how good it is to be back at my alma mater, Fordham Law School. Um, I graduated here a number of years ago, I think two buildings ago. Um, this building wasn't, this, this larger building wasn't here then. Uh, but it was a great education and a great opportunity to me, and I want to thank the school for that. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing in New York on music policy issues. I would like to welcome everyone to my district, which includes virtually every aspect of the music industry. New York City is home to thousands of creators, including songwriters, performers, and musicians, as well as broadcasters and some of the nation's leading technology companies. The issues we are considering today are of great concern to the people of this city, and I'm glad the committee is here because I firmly believe that this is a place where we can have an open dialogue, confront the issues, and forge consensus. And I hope that we can have a productive dialogue because music licensing issues are ripe for reform. The Judiciary Committee under Chairman Goodlatte's leadership has been conducting a comprehensive review of the Copyright Act. And we've heard a lot, a lot from music industry stakeholders on all sides about the need for change. Thankfully, there appears to be growing agreement around a number of issues that give us reason to hope that Congress may be able to move toward a legislative solution. I have long argued that we need to create a uniform system that levels the playing field for all radio services and ensures fair payment for all artists regardless of when the music was recorded or on what medium it is played. To that end, I introduce the Bipartisan Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, H.R. 1836, in case anyone's interested, along with several of my colleagues who are here today. The bill establishes a performance right for AM-FM radio, and it sets down a clear marker on the need to resolve the dispute over pre-1972 music, which does not currently have protection under the federal copyright laws. Under the bill, internet radio would continue to pay fair market value, but now its competitors would too, since satellite radio would no longer be granted a below market rate. And it, ampl and it simplifies the allocation of royalty payments to producers and engineers similar to the AMP Act, H.R. 831, introduced by my colleagues, Mr. Crowley and Mr. Rooney. Since we introduced the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, there have been a number of encouraging developments. The National Association of Broadcasters and the Music First Coalition are engaged in discussions on performance rights, and I'm hopeful that the parties will continue to negotiate in good faith <laughs> toward a solution that benefits both sides. Chairman Issa and I introduced the Classics Act, H.R. 3301, an updated pre-1972 provision to bring these recordings into the federal copyright system. The bill grants equal treatment for pre- and post-72 recordings, guaranteeing fair compensation for iconic legacy artists while providing legal certainty for digital services. This bill is the product of a consensus reached among a wide range of stakeholders, including digital services like Pandora, SAG-AFTRA, and the American Federation of Musicians, the Internet Association, major and independent record labels, and multiple artist rights organizations. And last month, Congressman Doug Collins and Congressman Hakeem Jeffries introduced the Music Modernization Act, H.R. 4706, otherwise known as the MMA, to address a number of issues governing the licensing of musical works. The bill reforms Section 115 of the Copyright Act to create a blanket license for mechanical reproduction royalties administered by a single entity, which will help ensure proper payments to songwriters and publishers. It also establishes a fair market rate standard for musical compositions under Section 115 and would, re and would repeal Section 114I, which prohibits rate court judges from considering sound recording royalty rates as evidence of setting performance royalty rates for songwriters and composers. In addition, it would require judges to be randomly assigned for ASCAP and BMI rate setting proceedings in the Southern District of New York. The Music Modernization Act is all supported, also supported by a wide range of stakeholders, including the Digital Media Association, representing companies such as Spotify and Amazon, the National Music Publishers, the PROs, 
and the number of songwriter advocacy organizations such as NSAI and SONA. For the last few years, I've been imploring the music community to come together in support of a common policy agenda. So, so it was music to my ears to see, to hear, I suppose, the unified statement of support for a package of reforms issued by key music industry leaders earlier this month. Many of these measures, such as the Classics Act and the Music Modernization Act, are supported by stakeholders on both sides, by digital service providers as well as by music creators. This emerging consensus gives us hope that this committee can start to move beyond the review stage toward legislative action. Now is the time for all parties to come together so, so that we can finally pass meaningful reform. We have a number of witnesses here today who will help us in this endeavor. I look forward to their testimony, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Nadler. We now welcome our very distinguished witnesses, and as is the practice of this committee, if you would please rise, I'll begin by swearing you all in. If you would raise your right hand. Do you and each of you solemnly swear that the testimony that you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you very much. You may be seated and let the record reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And now let me introduce uh, our witnesses. Uh, first uh, is Neil Portnow. Mr. Portnow is the president of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. Our second witness is Booker T. Jones. Mr. Jones is an American multi-instrumentalist, songwriter, record producer, and arranger, best known as the front man of the band Booker T. and the MGs. Our third witness is Aloe Black. Mr. Black is an American musician, singer, songwriter, record producer, actor, businessman, and philanthropist. Our fourth witness is Tom Douglas. Mr. Douglas is an American country music songwriter. Our fifth witness is Mike Klink. Mr. Klink is an American record producer. And our sixth and final witness is Dion Warwick. Ms. Warwick is an American singer, actress, and television show host, and a United Nations global ambassador for the Food and Agriculture Organization and the United States Ambassador of Health. Welcome to each and every one of you, and we will begin our testimony uh, with, um, with Mr. Portnow, and I'll just advise each of you that uh, your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety, and we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes to help you stay within that time. And there's a timing light on the table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. And when the light turns red, that's it. Time's up. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Portnow, uh, we also know that you can't stay for the entire hearing. And so we understand that and excuse you for other uh, activities that you have to engage in. But you uh, may begin. Welcome. Thank you so much. Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Nadler, members of the committee, my name is Neil Portnow. As president and CEO of the Recording Academy, I have the privilege of speaking today on behalf of the talented songwriters, artists, and studio professionals who comprise our membership. I want to welcome you all to Grammy Week. I also want to thank you for holding this hearing during music's biggest week and for inviting me to speak today. I'm also grateful for your understanding of the hectic calendar this week presents and my need to perhaps depart a little bit early. Three and a half years ago, I had the honor of testifying before this committee as the opening witness in the first hearing on music licensing. As I speak to you today, I come to you with a very different and more hopeful message. It's a message that our industry is ready to work with you in a unified manner to pass comprehensive music legislation. During the 15 years I've been coming to Washington for music creators, one constant I've heard from our friends on both sides of the aisle is that our industry needs to be united. Members of the committee, we listened. The march toward consensus reached an historic marker this month when more than 20 music organizations supported resolving a number of music licensing issues, including those embodied in the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, the Music Modernization Act, the AMP Act, and the Classics Act. You'll hear more about those endorsed proposals today from the actual creators who were affected. And the unity goes far beyond the music industry. 
Thanks to tireless work by Representatives Collins and Jeffries, the Music Modernization Act is endorsed not just by songwriters and publishers, but by digital music services. Thanks to Representatives Isa and Nadler, the Classics Act is supported not just by artists and labels, but by Pandora and the Internet Association. And thanks to Chairman Goodlad and Ranking Member Nadler, we are, as has been widely reported in the press, having discussions with the broadcasters over the issue of radio performance rights for artists. The lack of a radio performance royalty in the U.S. discredits our commitment to the intellectual property. We are the only nation in the developed world where radio can use an artist's work without permission or compensation. We know that this untenable inequity must change. Congress knows that this must change. But here's what's different today. Many in the broadcast community also know that this must change. As radio transitions to new business models, they know their future depends on working with, not against, the artist community. I believe the solution to the performance right issue can be resolved if both sides work in good faith and if Congress continues to demonstrate its commitment to fix this issue once and for all. This is an issue that artists will never stop fighting for until it's resolved. With this historic consensus on so many issues, what's next? Well, today's hearing is called Music Policy Issues, a Perspective from Those Who Make It. But to understand the creator's perspective, you must understand the creators themselves. In Washington, we often put music makers into categories, songwriter, artist, producer, engineer, but in the real world, as on this panel, it rarely works that way. Booker T. Jones started his career as a studio musician, but is also a recording artist, a songwriter, and a producer. Aloe Black is a chart-topping singer, but he's also a songwriter, musician, and record producer. Tom Douglas is a hit Nashville songwriter, but you'll hear Tom's voice and keyboards backing some of his tracks. And Mike Klink has been a producer, engineer, and mixer for the biggest rock bands in the world, but he's also a songwriter and a vocalist. Just as creators can't be compartmentalized, neither should music legislation. There are issues of consensus that would help all creators, and they're ready now to be marked up by this committee. When included in one unified package, you'll have a unified core of songwriters, artists, and producers working every day to pass it. I urge this committee to mark up one comprehensive music licensing package of the consensus issues. Dividing the issues will divide our community. Uniting the issues will create an advocacy force so powerful that passage will be all but guaranteed. Now, in two days and a few blocks from here, music creators will recognize their peers with music's highest honor. This, this covered award, the Grammy. Although the gramophone was... <laughs> Pass it down, please. Lifetime achievement. <laughs> Hold the clock. Although this gramophone was invented more than 100 years ago, the Grammy today represents the pinnacle of music of our time. <laughs> Similarly, some of our music laws were also established more than 100 years ago, but you can make those laws reflect our time as well. I urge this committee to seize this unique moment of consensus and pass comprehensive music licensing reform that will benefit all music creators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Port. Now, Mr. Nadler, Mr. Nadler was hoping that that was for him. But. Well, it's not too late. <laughs> uh, we now welcome uh, Mr. Jones. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Nadler, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify before you today, along with my fellow esteemed creators and my friend Neil Portnow, my name is Booker T. Jones, and I'm an artist, songwriter, and producer who has worked professionally in music for nearly 60 years. And that seems like a long time, and on some days it certainly feels that way. But many aspects of our music laws date back to an even earlier time, the player piano era. So I'm gratified that this committee is making the effort to up, to, for updating music laws. 
I've been privileged to record some of the most iconic R&B and soul records that define the genre, working with artists like Otis Redding and Bill Withers, and of course my own band, Booker T and the MGs. Our single, Green Onions, was one of the biggest hits of 1962. And that track has been called iconic, groundbreaking, even classic. But some music services have a less dignified name for it, pre-72, because of a quirk in the law. Many of our most timeless treasures are dismissed and disrespected as not meriting compensation to the featured artists, non-featured artists, and producers. You see, when Congress created the digital performance right, artists of my generation celebrated that we would now be paid for our classic works. But because sound recordings were not protected by federal copyright law until 1972, some digital radio services believe they can play my recordings from the 60s and early 70s without paying me. Sirius XM offers dozens of music channels where you can hear recordings made before 1972. So Sirius uses this catalog of great music to bring in billions of dollars. But they don't pay anything for the privilege of using the recorded tracks. This injustice is especially cruel for some of our great legacy artists. I'm fortunate to have my good health. I continue to make recordings and tour. In fact, tomorrow I'll be playing in Southwest Virginia, no doubt to some of Chairman's Goodlatte's constituents. But not all my peers are so fortunate. Other artists and their labels have been fighting to correct this, filing lawsuits at the state level. This uncertainty is bad for artists and it's bad for the digital music services. And this Congress, the Classics Act, introduced by Congressman Darrell Issa and Congressman Jerry Natalie, and co-sponsored by other members of this committee, would fix this problem once and for all. The legislation will also ensure that digital services are protected from future litigation. It's a win-win for everyone. I'm especially excited that the Classics Act has been introduced with support from Pandora and the Internet Association. Digital radio services don't want the legal uncertainty that comes from fighting lawsuits state to state. They just want to provide great music for their listeners. Classics demonstrates that stakeholders can work together to solve the issues to update our music licensing laws. In this same spirit of cooperation, cooperation, that led stakeholders to work together to create the AMP Act and the Music Modernization Act. All of these bills are important and should become law. And creators like myself have been actively lobbying for them. But our attention has been divided by different creators being asked to support differing and sometimes even competing approaches to solving these issues. What we creators need is to focus our combined efforts on a single package that resolves all of these issues. As a songwriter, producer, and artist, I can tell you that creators know we're all in this together. Give us this bill and we'll all work hard to pass it. And in this same spirit of cooperation, cooperation, it is long past time for music creators and broadcasters to finally resolve the lack of a performance right for sound recordings on AM, FM radio. So I ask the members of this committee to continue to ensure that the NAB and their members work with us to resolve the performance rights issue, just as we have worked with the digital services to resolve other issues. Excuse me. A sticky page. <laughs> From the Memphis sound of the 1960s to the sounds we'll celebrate in Madison Square Garden on Sunday, American music is America's gift to the world. But it will only remain so if creators are incentivized to continue to create. That's why the Founding Fathers put copyright in our Constitution. Fixing music licensing isn't just about legacy artists like myself. It's about the next generation of music makers who dream about a career in music. This committee, under the leadership of Chairman Goodlatte, has done the hard work over the past five years. You've identified the problems, and now you have the solutions with buy-in from the relevant players. 
Don't let this opportunity to bring music into the 21st century slip away. Correct the law now so that all music creators, whether they write, play, sing, produce, or engineer, can make a living from the work they do that enriches all our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Mr. Black, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Nadler, members of the committee. My name is Aloe Black, and I'm a songwriter. I'm a member of ASCAP, and I'm happy to be here today representing my colleagues and friends in the songwriting community. I know the Judiciary Committee has been hearing pretty regularly from songwriters over the past few years about our issues and struggles with the consent decrees, uh, below market rates, and our ideas for reform. And I'm proud that today we actually have a bill that addresses some of these issues. And legislation was recently introduced in both houses of Congress called the Music Modernization Act. And I wanna thank Rep Collins and, and Rep Jeffries for all that you've done and you've chosen to sponsor this bill. The Music Modernization Act is an important bill for songwriters um, because it finally brings our laws into the digital age. It includes key provisions that will help solve some of our challenges to getting a fair deal. The first is rate court reform. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I just wanted to put an exclamation on rate court reform. Um, this legislation would change ASCAP and BMI rate court procedures to make the rate setting process for performance rights consistent with other federal litigation by randomly assigning a federal judge using a lottery wheel system. Are we just trying to make it consistent with the other systems? That's all. That's all. The second is repealing section 114I of the Copyright Act so that a judge could consider all relevant evidence when determining songwriter compensation including what record labels and artists make for the exact same performance, rather than just making this decision in a vacuum. Real world. Let's use real world information to see how people are making their livings. With these two provisions, the legislation will enable judges representing a variety of perspectives to consider a broader set of relevant evidence when determining rates songwriters can earn from the use of their music. Right now, the cards are stacked against us when it comes to rate court. These changes will help level the playing field for us so we can at least hope for compensation for our music that better reflects its value to the people who listen to it. In addition to reforming how performance rights are considered, the MMA greatly improves how mechanical royalty rates are determined by the Copyright Royalty Board every five years by updating the standard used by the judges. The MMA changes the rate standard to a willing seller, willing buyer, which reflects rates negotiated in a free market. This will dramatically improve fairness for songwriters in terms of how their work is valued and helps us get fair royalties from the massive interactive streaming companies who rely, wouldn't exist without absolutely need or are dependent on, don't, ex don't have a chance in hell without our rights, without our music, and who currently pay a below market rate. The bill also eliminates the bulk NOI loophole, which has allowed streaming companies to hold on to millions of dollars that they should be paying out to songwriters and publishers. Unlike many things in Washington, D.C. these days, the le this legislation actually has bipartisan support. And further defying the odds, the music and technology industries have also come together in support of it. And you ask us for a consensus bill. We are delivering a consensus bill. And now it's time to move forward. <coughs> I've been fortunate to find some success in making music. And that's because I'm a recording artist. I also have the revenue stream from touring and endorsement deals. But for some of my friends who are just songwriters, okay. the majority of their money is from the performance of a song collected by their performing rights organization, like when it's played in a bar or streamed on a service. These performance royalties are what enables songwriters to put food on their table. That would make songwriters the smallest 
business you can think of in America. These are small business men and women. My example, an example I can give you, Wake Me Up was my, my biggest hit. Uh, it was streamed by two leading interactive services for a combined 136 million times in the past four quarters alone. Yet as one of three co-writers, which is the trend nowadays, we get in a room with other writers, we, we're collaborative. You know, we do things together. I only received 20, about 2,400 bucks, and that's only 1.8 cents for every 1,000 streams. It's hard for a songwriter to earn a living when counting pennies. Now, this is a defining time for music licensing reform, and I can tell you we're all in desperate need of change. If we're going to protect what is arguably America's greatest export, I would just, personally, I would say it is America's greatest export, which is music, um, we need to make some changes. And I applaud all of you for taking the time to understand our issues and hopefully advocate on our behalf. Now is the time to take action. And I urge you to move this legislation through quickly. Songwriters need the relief. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Black. Mr. Douglas, welcome. Thank you. Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking member, member Nadler, and members of the House Committee on the Judiciary, thank you for the opportunity to testify about the Music Modernization Act of 2017, which I will refer to today as the MMA. This legislation is critically important for songwriters. It addresses multiple areas of the music licensing ecosystem and is a bipartisan bill supported by an unprecedented collection of songwriter groups, other music industry groups, and the digital services themselves. My story is similar to that of most American songwriters. I began writing songs at an early age while I was still in school. After graduation, I moved to Nashville to make my uh, profession in songwriting. After a few years with little success at songwriting and wanting to marry and raise a family, I moved to Dallas to work in the real estate business. Attending a songwriting seminar in Austin six years later, I handed a cassette tape copy of one of my songs to a noted music producer, Paul Worley. Thankfully, he listened to that song when he returned to Nashville, and that song, Little Rock, became a number one hit for Colin Ray in 1994. It was about a man in recovery, and it still serves as an anthem for individuals and their families dealing with substance abuse. And while I was not dealing with substance abuse, I guess part of the song was really about me adapting to life without songwriting as my job. People don't know the songwriter Tom Douglas, but their lives have been enriched by my songs, such as The House That Built Me, I Run To You, Raise Them Up, Grown Men Don't Cry, and Southern Voice. This is true of all songwriters, especially those who are not artists. Our songs identify American culture and move hearts and minds across the globe. Our songs have value. That's why adoption of the MMA is critical. The Music Modernization Act includes a new rate standard for songwriters' digital mechanical streaming royalties. The copyright, the copyright Royalty Board will be able to utilize the willing buyer, willing seller rate standard that should result in more equitable rates because it's based on what my song is worth in the free market. Song ownership issues are addressed through a new blanket licensing entity called the Music Licensing Collective. Governed by music publishers and songwriters, the collective will assume responsibility for finding owners and keeping track of the ownership data. Digital services will be relieved from copyright infringement liability if they adhere to best practices. The U.S. Copyright Office mass notice of intent program that created many burdens on songwriters and resulted in millions of dollars of unpaid royalties will be eliminated. Songwriters will, for the first time, be legally entitled to at least half of all unclaimed funds from digital mechanicals to be equitably distributed based on songwriter activity. And ASCAP and BMI rate court judges will be randomly selected instead of being appointed for life. By eliminating Section 114I of the Copyright Act, those judges will be able to consider market factors like what record labels and artists earn for performances on the songs I wrote. When my first hit song, Little Rock, was climbing the charts, 
Artists sold millions of albums and broadcast royalty was not being challenged by streaming companies yet to exist. My royalties for record sales or terrestrial radio broadcast were counted in pennies. When my song is streamed, royalties are counted in micro pennies. For songwriters, it's not uncommon for millions of streams to equal only hundreds of dollars in royalty payments. For many years, songwriters have begged Congress for relief. The entire American music songwriter community is hopeful we will begin finding that relief in the Music Modernization Act. The MMA won't immediately or completely solve all of our um, the songwriter's digital rate woes, but it sets us on the right path. The present standard of evidence to set my mechanical royalty rates was established by Congress in 1909 for player piano roles. Why so long? Because reaching agreements between songwriters, music publishers, performing rights societies, record labels, streaming companies, and their representative organizations is Herculean. But the MMA represents precisely such a compromise. Congressman Doug Collins should be commended for his ability to navigate the differences these groups held. He and Congressman Hakeem Jeffries have led our industry into a new era of cooperation with the introduction of the Music Modernization Act of 2017. On behalf of songwriters, I ask the House Committee on the Judiciary to swiftly adopt this historic legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Mr. Klink, welcome. Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member at Nadler, and members of the committee, it is an honor to be here in New York during Grammy Week to discuss issues affecting music creators, and specifically those affecting Klink, my you may want to producer. pull that microphone a little closer to you. Oh. You would think I'd do better, you know, being a, a producer engineer here, you know? <laughs> Give you tips anytime. Okay. <laughs> Make you sound better. Should I start over or just? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, but I say specifically those affecting my fellow producers and engineers. Now you may, may be wondering what's a guy who produced Guns N' Roses, Megadeth, and Motley Crue records doing in a suit testifying at a cr congressional hearing. <laughs> Well, it's actually not as strange as it seems. I've had the good fortune of making successful records. It sold millions of copies, and now I want to make sure that the next generation of creators who don't have the benefit of that antiquated concept, record sales, can make a fair wage. As proud as I am of my work in the studio, I'm equally proud of the work I'm able to do in the producers and engineers wing of the Recording Academy. The wing works hard with other stakeholders to ensure that there is a future for professional producers and engineers. But for that, we need your help. Despite playing an indispensable role in the creation of sound recordings, music producers have never been mentioned in any part of federal copyright law. Our fingerprints are all over the creation and direction of a sound recording, and our creativity is reflected in what we listen to. There is no Sgt. Peppers without George Martin, no Thriller without Quincy Jones, and if I may, no Appetite for Destruction without Mike Klink. <laughs> The studio professionals are integral to the creation of the final track, just as the songwriters and musicians are so integral. When it comes to compensation, producers currently have no legislated way to collect royalties. Since 1995, when Congress created a performance right for digital services, performers and labels have been entitled to a statutory performance royalty. Producers were not mentioned. Thus, the producers must indirectly collect their share from the artist. This is an ineffective and unnecessary process that can result in a months-long delay before we get paid. And in some cases, for older recordings, it's impossible to even reach the artist or the heirs. Sound Exchange has established a voluntary system of letters of direction to pay producers directly. We are very grateful to Sound Exchange for establishing this system. But they and we believe it should be codified into law. That's why I was so heartened by the efforts from Congressman Joe Crowley and Tom Rooney in 2015 
and again last year to introduce the Allocation for Music Producers Act, or the AMP Act. The AMP Act codifies the producer's right to collect the royalties we are owed, extending for the first time copyright protections to studio professionals. It would codify the letter of direction process used by SoundExchange so that producers can be paid directly, quickly, and accurately. And it also includes a provision that would allow producers to collect a small percentage of royalties from older works subject to the determination of the artist or heir. The AMP Act does not change the artist's statutory rights, but just improves the efficiency of payments determined by the artist. It is a common sense approach that is the result of two years of negotiation between all affected parties. It has the endorsement of Sound Exchange, the Recording Academy, and nearly 20 other music organizations, and the bipartisan support from more than 50 co sponsors. Now, with such wide consensus and no opposition to the AMP Act, this should be easy to pass as a standalone bill. But that's not what the producer community is asking of you today. Creators are all in this together, and we want our friends in the songwriting and artist communities to achieve the necessary changes to laws that will help all creators. Thus, we ask Congress to include the AMP Act in comprehensive music licensing reform that also includes the consensus provisions of the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, the Music Modernization Act, and the Classics Act. The artists, songwriters, producers, and engineers I work with are ready to roll up our sleeves and work hard to pass a comprehensive bill. And I can promise that thousands of members of the Producers and Engineers Wing of the Recording Academy will be your front line. <coughs> I applaud the efforts of this committee for undertaking this endeavor to help hundreds of thousands of American creators make a living doing the work so valued by our country and the world. I know that these reforms will create a better future for tomorrow's producers, songwriters, and artists. Thank you. Mr. Klink, thank you very much. We are honored to have you with us today. I'm pleased Thank to be here. Thank you so very much. Well, Chairman Goodlatt, Ranking Member Nadler, and members of the committee, I want to first of all thank you for giving me the opportunity to again testify with regards to this very same issue. Um, it's also an honor for me to join my esteemed colleagues in sharing our experience in music creators and the need for Congress to protect our craft. Music has always been a part of my life. I've been fortunate enough to have a career spanning more than half a century. I've been honored to record and perform with some of the most talented, iconic artists and musicians of our time. We all get to do what we love for fans who love what we do. It's particularly gratifying to know how my work and the work of my contemporaries has endured. On any given day, you can hear our music belting from speakers, lifting spirits, fueling memories, and inspiring new generations of creators. Yep, clearly, our recordings still have value. You might even say, like all of us, we get better with age. <laughs> After all, there are entire channels on Sirius XM dedicated to music of the 60s and 70s. But here's something strange. Artists and labels get paid for music played on the 70s channel that was recorded after February 15, 1972. But we get absolutely nothing for the music played on the 60s and 70s channels recorded before that date. Now, I think that's completely ridiculous, but then what can, who am I? How could it be that 1979's recording of I Know I'll Never Love This Way Again receives compensation, but 1969's I'll Never Fall in Love Again or my exceptional co-panelist Booker T. Jones' 1962 hit Green Onions does not? Why? 
It can't be because the 60 songs have no value or they wouldn't offer that channel. It's our music and <coughs> our we simply experience a form of digital ageism. In a way, yes. Due to a quirk in history, copyright law, February 15, 1972, effectively serves as the benchmark of my value. We are essentially being told that we are too old to be compensated for our work. I know it was never intended to be this way. It's just a fluke of timing, but services like SiriusXM have embraced this legal loophole to help make billions without sharing a cent of it with those who made the music. That's not only inappropriate from a business standpoint, it's morally inexcusable. After all, many of these legacy artists are no longer able to record, to tour, or to make appearances. It is precisely these older recordings that provide the funding for their growing medical bills, their well-deserved retirement, withholding compensation for the product of their labor simply because of an arbitrary date makes no sense. It's just not right, and it must be fixed. That is why I was thrilled to hear that Congress has finally taken up the cause this year and is poised to include this important issue in a package of needed, needed perform, reforms that will help artists, producers, and songwriters. I spoke out in support of the Respect Act and the Fair, Play, Fair Pay Act when they were introduced. And now I want to give special thanks to Representatives Issa and Nadler for introducing the Classics Act, which protect pre-1972 recordings. The wonderful thing about the bill is that it enjoys the support of not only legacy artists, but services like Pandora and organizations like the Internet Association that understand the legal certainty, licensing convenience, and ethical decency it provides. The entire community has joined together in support of this change. I want to raise one other issue. To this day, terrestrial, I can hardly say the word, <laughs> AM, FM radio uses our recordings without any compensation at all. For nearly a century, an entire industry has made a very lucrative business generating advertising off of our music. Our attention to this issue has spanned generations, unfortunately, without positive outcome. Now, I understand that productive negotiations are going on now between broadcasters and the music community, and I ask you all to call. I ask that you call on the parties to successfully resolve this issue once and for all so that our parties can finally be paid fairly for their work. I know I'm out of time, almost. Recording artists have never been more optimistic about the prospects for legislation that will allow music to flourish. As I said, the entire music community supports the Classics Act to finally compensate our country's celebrated legacy artists. It supports the AMP Act, which will ensure that music producers receive their royalties. It supports a royalty rate standard for both artists and songwriters that will provide market-based compensation for those creators. creators. It also supports the Music Modernization Act, which establishes a licensing system for songwriters better suited for digital age. We hope that the committee will quickly move to this comprehensive legislative packet together as one, just like we have come together as one community. Tim Goodlatt, Ranking Member Nedler, we greatly appreciate your leadership on this multi-year copyright and music licensing review. They're not easy issues, but this committee has worked hard to bring the parties together to identify points of common interest and to help find acceptable and effective solutions. So let's go make it happen together. After all, that's what friends are for. <laughs> As I once sang, notably, in 1967. <laughs> I say a little prayer for you and hope that this year, when all those who write, sing, 
record, and produce the songs we love are recognized and appropriately compensated for their work. I also wanted to ask you, can we do this retrospectively? <laughs> <laughs> Reactive? You know what I mean? Take me back to 1962 when I first recorded. How about that? When all these, these, these things were continuing to, go, to sustain itself. I'm out of time, aren't I? Okay, sorry. Thank you, Ms. Warwick. And we'll now proceed uh, with questions under the five-minute rule, and I'll begin by recognizing myself. Uh, and I'll start with uh, Mr. Douglas and Mr. Black. Uh, how has the ability of a songwriter to make a living changed over the past several decades? Has the total number of songwriters increased or decreased? And what would you tell a young songwriter about their chances for success in 2018 and beyond? Mr. Douglas. Well, the number of songwriters in Nashville has has been greatly diminished, uh, really because the the ability to to make a living, which is primarily from um, <coughs> performance income and digital income. I mean, both those two income sources have been really eviscerated as the distribution of music has gone almost completely to streaming. And in streaming, we're getting paid micro pennies instead of pennies. So, I mean, the, 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 the ability to make an income is just, is, is, is really just disappearing, um, you know, as technology has outpaced creativity. So it's, uh, it's, uh, as we say, there's, there's uh, blood in the streets in Nashville, metaphorically speaking, just because uh, it's, it's gotten so hard to make a living. Mr. Black? Yeah, I would I agree with Mr. Douglas, and I would say, um, if we just look at the math, you know, the numbers that I presented in a, in a quarter, three months, for one of, you know, the, the biggest hits that I've made, and... Um, that's, it comes out to about $800 a month as a songwriter. Um, and I would be pressed as a songwriter without the extra income. A lot of the folks I know in Nashville are just songwriters. Nine o'clock in the morning, they're in. Five o'clock, they're out. That's how they feed their families. At 800 bucks a month, it doesn't work. And you gotta make a hit to get the 800 bucks a month, not just an album cut. Then you gotta make multiple hits in order to just cover rent and then to pay your family, I don't know how many hits you gotta do and in a market where you're competing against everyone else. It's just not tenable. So the idea that there can be you know, a free market system where we can decide help, you know, with the help of our performing rights organizations on the value of our songs. Thank you. Jones? Uh, Ms. Warwick. Yes. Uh, I think I know your answer to this question, but is there any reason that you can imagine that the law should make your works from the late 1960s and early 1970s less worthy of compensation <laughs> than your works and the works of others from mid-1970s till now? Absolutely. I think, first of all, I'm entitled to it. Uh, my career is based on recorded music played on radio constantly. And over the past 57 years now, my recordings have been played, have not been paid. And I don't think it's fair. Simply. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Yes, I just, sir, I just wanted to... Um, I want to ask you a question, and you can answer too. Oh, no, go ahead. sorry. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the music industry changing over the next several decades? And how has the internet enabled artists to be more connected to their fans? Well, Chairman Goodlatte, um, before this young man came along, people were selling records over the counter, 45s and uh, albums, and there were mechanical royalties. And that's where the songwriter got his pennies, was when those sales transcribed. Uh, fast forward to about 2000. 2012, when all the the uh, CDs stopped cross, crossing the count, those mechanicals disappeared, and there lies the difficulty of of making us uh, a living as a songwriter with only the streaming income. So that the industry completely changed, turned on turned on its head, 
And uh, that's, just, that's just gone. It's gone probably forever. I don't know if we'll ever go back to uh, vinyl sales being what they were. But that's how we made our money. We looked forward to it. And it was a quarterly income. And uh, my income dropped in uh, 2007 by about half uh, when people stopped buying the CDs. So it, that, it was just a quirk. Uh, that, 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 was how, that was how it did. It was the mechanicals. And uh, we were paid uh, a fairly decent, fair rate on mechanicals, but it's, it's gone. And my second question, <laughs> sorry, how the internet has enabled artists to connect with their fans, because we've got to look ahead too. Absolutely, great enabler, great enabler, but that is uh, dependent on what we're doing here today, actually. Absolutely, thank you. My time is about to expire. We'll recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to ask this question of, 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 first of all, Mr. Jones, and after that, Ms. Warwick. In your testimony, Mr. Jones, you state that many of the most timeless treasures, including sitting on the dock of the bay in Soul Man and the time is tight, are dismissed and disrespected as not meriting compensation to the featured artists and non-featured artists and producers. How does this impact you and the artists you have worked with over the years? Would you like that answer in, um, in an estimation of uh, dollars and cents, sir? Or, or would you... I, I, I don't know. The value, I think that um, the, the impact is um, not really quantifiable. It, it's just so huge because um, um, those companies uh, rely on those songs for their... I, I am a subscriber. I'm a subscriber. I have uh, Sirius Radio in my Jeep and I have it in my other Jeep. You have to pay to listen to your own yes, music, sir. which you don't get paid. Yes, sir. I pay. I pay, and I don't even, <laughs> I don't even get the benefit. Uh, but those are my favorite channels, and, and they're the reason that I subscribe to those services, uh, because I listen to 50s and 60s. I like the big bands, and, and of course, the 60s music is my favorite. But um, it, I, I can't give you a quantifiable answer. I could get back to you on that. I... I Ms. Warwick, I'll ask you the same question, but I don't need a quantity. Um, <laughs> basically, how does it impact? How does, would you repeat the question? How does it, the, the pre-72 lack of compensation, how does that impact? Oh, heavens. Uh, for any artist that recorded in that period of time prior to that 70s, um, most of my peers, and I'm sure that Booker T can... Um, attest to this. A lot of them are no longer with us. Their estates are nil because of lack of payment. Uh, a lot of them are not able to perform any longer. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a major impact on financial stabilities. Um, just being able to live today. Uh, to be compensated for the work that has been done is primarily what we should be. I mean, it should not be just overlooked. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Warwick, you uh, suggested, uh, I don't know how seriously, that uh, well, I was it would be nice that if we could pay 372 royalties retroactively or retrospectively. Um, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm just going to say that some people, many people, look to the Bible as a source of moral guidance. And it says in the Bible, you shall not cause the wages of a worker to remain with you overnight. We have caused the wages of workers to remain with us since, pre since 1972. So maybe that should guide us a little as we consider some of this legislation. Um, I was going to ask Mr. Port now, but I'll ask whoever wants to answer this question. Everyone has talked about um, uh, we should get together, obviously. I've been telling people we should get together for a long time. But how important is it that we consider a unif one unified package of bills that will unite songwriters, artists, and producers? And is the music industry ready to work together with Congress to pass a broad set of reforms? Who wants to take that? I think it's absolutely necessary. Based on the fact I was brought into this particular entity by Frank Sinatra many, many years ago, when he decided that he wanted his band to be paid for producing the music that you were listening to. Um, and he finally said, Dion, you know, you're not getting a cent every time your record is played, and you should be. 
And I totally agree with him. This is why I said retroactively, we'd love to get paid from 1962 up to now. Um, but uh, this is, is, is something that just morally should be thought about. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Jones, I have one more question. My time is going to run out. Mm -hmm. uh, in your testimony, you state that the Classics Act is supported by Pandora and the Internet Association. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you think digital services support the bill? I think they have a very valid business reason, to be honest with you, to support it. Um, they want their, um, as, as I said in my testimony, uh, uh, defending yourself state to state doesn't really make sense uh, for something that, that's going to eventually become a federal law. And uh, as Dion said, I'm uh, sorry, Ms. Warwick, as Ms. Warwick said, it's, a, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's absolutely inevitable. There's been a convergence of consensus of cooperation uh, that we, we're all in this together. Uh, and the, the digital services and the, and the creators, are, we really should be all on the same side. We shouldn't be differing on these issues. And I think they realize this. In other words, you're saying two reasons. One, the moral reason. Mm -hmm. To uh, the uncertainty of litigation state by state. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Thank you. Uh, the chair is now pleased to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, the chairman of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and first of all, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that a policy essay, which has been accepted by the Harvard Journal of Litigation, be placed in the record. Without objection, will be made a part of the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Second of all, I want to take a, a moment to thank you. Uh, the suggestions that are being heard here today that individual pieces of legislation that have been spawned, if you will, from uh, these many, many hearings that you have put yourself and your family through uh, as you've gone around to hear it, uh, wouldn't have happened without your leadership. Uh, obviously, part of that is to break a rule, which is, uh, you know, in Washington, there's an old expression that there's no limit to how far you can go if you don't worry about who gets the credit. Now, that was said by somebody who wanted the credit for saying it. <laughs> uh, and and it actually at least two presidents have taken credit for the same the same announcement. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I want to ask that you very much uh, succumb to the request by the many members of your committee who have worked on the various pieces and do just that, to put together the combined consensus bill, because I think you've heard here today, uh, and I've heard before this, uh, that this is the only way that we're going to move this kind of legislation. Each of these pieces has broad bipartisan support and has support within many aspects of the industry, but it is now uh, a unique time, and your leadership and your work uh, creates that opportunity. Uh, the uh, And when we look at, and I'll just briefly say, uh, one one fifteen or blanket uh, licensing and the other reforms, Classic Act, AMP, and so on, the work of each of the members here has been the result of your leadership and guidance. So as I do something that I've never been known for, which is suck up, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want you to know that that's, uh, that's the commitment I make to you, that it is that time. Now, I would like to uh, get back to my piece of this pie and... Uh, Ms. Warwick, yes. uh, I grew up. We're more closer to the same age than I would we care to admit. In other words, uh, okay. <laughs> the, uh, but the fact is I grew up on your music. Mm -hmm. And I, I share with you this challenge. But I'd like to put into the record with your answering a question. You do get paid some right now for your pre-72 work, right? By some um, companies. As has been, I think, iterated, pennies. Yeah. But those pennies, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say, and, and, and uh, Mr. Jones, I'll ask you the same question, that one of the greatest inequities we're dealing with in the particular of the classics is that if some pay, whether it's pennies, nickels, or dimes, if some pay and others don't, we truly have an unfair competition problem by those who don't. In other words, I'm sympathetic to you, as, as all of you, as creative artists, mm. in the desire to get you your fair compensation and to come up with a method for it. Mm -hmm. But this committee has pretty broad jurisdiction, and beyond copyright, we have a great interest in making sure that there is not, if you will, antitrust, unfair competition, and all the other laws we've put into place so that businesses 
can in fact have a business model that is not stifled by somebody else's business advantage. Mm -hmm. And so, Ms. Warwick, you, uh, you mentioned terrestrial radio, which is not worth here, but obviously, I listen to your music anytime I'm, I turn on AM or FM. I do tend to listen to the, the, the stations yeah. that have your music. And your lovely angelic voice coming across for no money has always bothered me. How do you feel about just that narrow question of the fact that you do get some compensation from some, and those companies are working against free, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, you know... <clears throat> I, I personally have always said, once I got involved with this particular issue, if it were not for artists such as us, um, there would be no radio stations. And there would be no radio stations because they depend upon their um, access to the, well, what, what is it called? Um, advertising. The advertisers... I've never seen a station that plays only advertising. Well, what, guess what? <laughs> if it were not for the music, the advertisers wouldn't have an interest in the radio station. So that's, that's where I see it. Very true. And uh, Mr. Jones? If, if I may clarify, uh, before 1972, um, we do receive some income from our recordings if it's transmitted digitally. Right. However, if it's... Aside from the digital transmission, there is no payment. That's right. There is nothing over uh, analog radio, uh, uh, the National Association of Broadcasting. We don't receive any money at all for that and never have. Exactly. And just in closing, but when you're sitting there looking at all the various facilities and technologies that are presenting your music, mm -hmm. Does you know how do you feel about the fact that some are paying you some money and some aren't, and as a result, you're not getting an equal opportunity for some of these emerging uh, technologies that do pay you to get to succeed, aren't they? Absolutely. Actually, I think I think it, it lacks a spirit of cooperation. I think it it, ben it does benefit us to have our music played over radio. However, it is property. It is property that's being used, and and there should be some right. Uh, for the ownership of that property, and it just does not exist pre-1972 unless it's transmitted over a digital medium. That's right. So that's, that's the problem. That's the quirk. And uh, it is intellectual property. It belongs to the people that create it. Uh, and they have no right. There's no right on paper. They have no right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the chair is now pleased to recognize the gentleman from the music-loving state of Tennessee, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm also from the music, really, origins of the world, Memphis, Tennessee. And, and that's where music was really given birth. And I'd like to ask Tom a question. Uh, you, your song you wrote is kind of your most famous song. It's called Little Rock. Uh, I've, I've heard that more songs are written about leaving Nashville and going to Memphis than any other two cities. <laughs> <laughs> John Hyatt had Memphis in the meantime, right. lots of others. Why are all the songs written about leaving Nashville <laughs> and going to Memphis? <laughs> I think you have to leave home to find home. Maybe, 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 maybe that's it. Good answer. I, I, I didn't know so much about your career, but I, I read it a little bit about it here. I, I went—I was a college friend of Paul Worley's. Oh yes, sir. He was a beta, and I was close to them. We were in, at Vandy, and Paul's a great guy. And you were inducted in the Hall of Fame with, with Paul Kraft, who was a Memphian, and yes, and, and a friend, and wrote some crazy songs too. They, they were—I uh, wouldn't have a career without Paul, Paul Worley, and we dearly miss Paul Kraft. So you was, seem like from reading that you're the Don Schlitz of this generation. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a high standard. I'm, I'm not sure anybody can quite reach Don's standard, but thank you. It is a high standard. It seems like you made it. Uh, Ms. Warwick, I'm a big fan of yours as well. I guess we all are. And I appreciate the fact that you, when Isaac Hayes passed, you, you sent a special uh, notice and mm -hmm. memorialized, memorialized Isaac, who I know you did some music with. Uh, you know, Isaac was just a star, and I appreciate that more than anything you've done. To remember him when he passed, that meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to people in Memphis. Thank you. He meant a lot to me. Yeah. And I, I get was... your music. I, I See, I drive a 76 Peugeot and 86 Cadillac, mm -hmm. and when I turn on the AM radio, it goes straight to your music. Mm -hmm. it just... <laughs> yeah, see? Even your, even your car knows. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you. 
Thank you. Is there anybody that has anything that can they say that uh, people, anybody that's against these bills, do you all know of anybody against the bills or anything in the bills that's not something you'd like? I know legislation is compromised. Is there something you'd like to tell us that we ought to change? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, retroactivity, I know. Uh, I, I, about, it's got to be almost 10 years now ago, we had a forum that was held in Indiana. And it was to discuss exactly what we're discussing today, pay for play. Um, radio stations felt that we were gouging them and how can you dare ask us to pay you for playing your music? How can we not ask them to pay me for playing my music? I, uh, we found that their only argument was mom and pop stations. Well, wait a minute. Mom and pop stations exist exactly the way that any other radio station does. Advertising cost, money, 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 money. Greed became the issue. We also found that any audience that was there, very much like this, was totally surprised to find that we were not being paid every time they hear, heard my records on the radio. You mean you don't get paid when I hear you? No, I don't. Well, I agree with it. That you should be paid when your songs are played. You know, I, I know that Burt Backrack was a great songwriter. But and without, Hal David. And, 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 and him too. Hal him David. Too. Not, well, without you, you singing them, they, they, they might not have gone anywhere. There you go. And all the people that wrote Elvis's music. Oh, you're absolutely right. If it wasn't Elvis singer, it wouldn't have gone nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you got to have the singer, and Sinatra did it for all those other people. That's I mean, right. They were great songwriters, but... Uh, who, who represents the performers, if anybody? Songwriters have got a crew, and producers apparently all have got somebody now. Does anybody represent the, the, the performers as a group? What do you mean when you say represent the performers? Yes, yeah, SAG after. They are. That's uh -huh. who represents y'all. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, and what was the song you, you said you, you were saying maybe who produced this song maybe shouldn't be here? What was it called? Something about destruction? Oh, no, that was the album called Appetite for Destruction, which had uh, Sweet Child of Mine, uh, Welcome to the Jungle. And, and, uh, you foresaw President Trump, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sweet Child of Mine. <laughs> Mr. Black, you, you wrote a song called Dystopia. And until this year and Donald Trump, I didn't know much about dystopia. <laughs> it's kind of become the, the word now. What is your song about? Uh, it's, it's an album. It's an entire album, actually, called Dystopia, and it, it, it speaks really toward, to social issues, uh, the disparity between the rich and the poor, the, the issues that are facing some of the uh, marginalized uh, communities in society, in the, in the inner cities. And, um, uh, you know, my goal with music is to make positive social change, but part of that is also speaking truth to power and, and just saying what I see, as so many of my uh, heroes in music had done like Marvin Gaye with What's Going On, Eugene McDaniels with Headless Heroes of the Apocalypse, um, and, and so forth. Thank you. I'll have to buy it and listen to it. I'm sure I'll appreciate it. I appreciate what you're trying to do for malaria, and we'll work on that too. Great. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Mm. The chair is now pleased to recognize the gentleman from Texas and a musical family, uh, Mr. Louis Gomer. <laughs> it's great to be with you. And, uh, after hearing your songs back in the late 60s, I didn't think I'd ever fall in love again. But anyway, y'all have all brought so much uh, joy and added so much to our lives. And uh, we want people to be able to make a living doing that. Before I came along, though, I'd read about uh, something called payola, which uh, uh, People that recorded songs, wrote songs, knew if they could just get the radio station to play them, then they could be a big hit. And that is why back in those days, nobody thought of having the radio stations pay other people. It was hard enough to prevent the bribes going to DJs. But uh, obviously things have changed over the years. Um, but I I'm curious, does anybody know the state of negotiations with the terrestrial broadcast radio. You might know how things stand. Because I was under the impression that everybody was on board with the MMA. Do you know? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, that is that is something that's going on. The chairman made right mention. It's been mentioned before. That is something that I'm very proud to say that the uh, 
the artists and the uh, NAB are sitting down. They have been meeting almost for a year now, and I'm very proud of what they're doing. They've come, they're getting a lot closer than where they, they have been on this issue, and it's something that I think everybody wants to see solved, and I am proud of the work that is being done there. We set that on a different track, and that track is working, and will continue to work. Oh, good. Well, thank you. And we're claiming my time. Let me just um, ask, since I've been in Congress, we've also been getting lobbied by artists as uh, I mean, m musicians that play for songs and also producers saying, hey, we should be able to have it legislated so that we get a percentage of whatever comes about. Um, I just like y'all's impression on that. Um, that. I'm concerned that there'll be more and more people asking for percentage as the pennies have gotten smaller and smaller. My goodness, when you make... Uh, one to two hundredths of a cent on a play it's it's hard for anybody to buy a mansion as i've heard others say it. yeah this was a hit i wrote it and i was able to buy a mansion you don't buy mansions on uh, two hundredths of a of a of a cent but what's y'all's thought on percentages for musicians and and producers yeah well i, I can talk about the producers i can i can tell you that uh uh, nothing changes for the artist. I mean, nothing changes. That's what's so great about it. I mean, all producers are looking for is uh, clarity in the law to make it easier to get the royalties that we are already uh, entitled to get. I mean, he, when you look at a producer, a producer is, you know, w when they talk about the Beatles, they say George Martin was the fifth Beatle, you know. His fingerprints were all over the Beatles. I don't think that they would have been able to do what they could do without his input. And I think that anybody who is a producer is a partner with the artist. And it's been already negotiated that we uh, have that royalty. Uh, and we're just looking for a bit of clarity in the law and make it easier to uh, be recognized. Anybody else? <clears throat> Are there any, I know this has been negotiated with um, streaming uh, sources and also satellite radio, but uh, what are your thoughts on what's been agreed to with regard to payment through satellite radio and streaming? It seems like you're still getting a pretty small amount. Is that? Streaming is still, um, is still extremely low, and the main the main issue is the rate court um, when it comes to uh, uh, PROs being able to, you know, negotiate without uh, having to do a, uh, in a scenario where a, a judge is making decisions that don't take into account all of the relevant information on on what the rates should be. Um, the uh, Recording labels are getting paid for the master uh, side of the recording, which is the actual <clears throat> audio that you hear. But on the songwriting side, the intellectual property, this is where we are stuck behind these antiquated rules that I believe can be changed with the Music Modernization Act. And, well, my time's expired, so just let me just say, I hope we get it done this time because I can't imagine anything that's better. The world is ours whenever we're together. <laughs> so thank you. I thank the gentleman and the chair is now pleased to recognize the brand new ranking member of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all uh, for being panelists today and telling us your experiences. Uh, Mr. Black, in your testimony, you state that uh, right now the cards are stacked against songwriters in rate court, and uh, so you are in favor of the Music Modernization Act, which would um, change the, uh, the standard uh, that uh, is used to determine royalty rates, and uh, it would also uh, do away with the current setup with the judges and uh, install a um, a uh, a board, a, a mechanical licensing 
collective that would give songwriters a seat at the table. Can you explain uh, to us how uh, important that is to uh, uh, a fair royalty rate? Sure, mechanical license, um, as the name implies, uh, is the mechanical performance of a song, a payment for a mechanical performance of a song. And it's antiquated, as Mr. Jones had mentioned, comes from the uh, playing of, of uh, piano players, scrolled piano players. Um, today, we have, we have new systems and new ways to, to play music. Um, the mechanical licensing system uh, in pay is even antiquated because it hasn't grown with inflation. Uh, I think when it started, it was, you know, from the time it started to, to today, it should be at about 50 to 60 cents per song sold. Mm -hmm. um, instead, it's only hovering around nine cents. So not only do, are we undercompensated just with the, the concept of inflation over the years, there's the, the digital streaming of our music is sitting behind this rate court or on the mechanical side. Um, not allowing for real negotiation to happen for the value of the music. Um, and you know, this is where I, I feel like MMA is going, to, is going to really make a dramatic impact on the income of songwriters. Does anyone want to add anything to that? I think, I think the ratio is, is quite different, quite, quite a bit lower is, is uh, maybe the, es the essence of what he's saying. And, the songwriters are paid a, a much lower ratio in compared to uh, the mechanicals the, that we were paid. The payment's lower uh, the, the, uh, at, a, at a lesser rate. The rate hasn't been uh, uh, accelerated to what it should be. Yes. Okay. I'm not sure what, how, how you're... Uh, well, what we have is a situation where we don't have nowadays the physical embodiment of the of the sound mm -hmm. being sold, but we've got the streaming process taking place. So no physical copies being sold. Or, of course, you do have some being sold, but that part of the market is start is shrinking. I think at, at the end of the day, the the copyright owners should have the right to decide what the value of the transaction is because they own the copyright. In any other business, a creator gets to decide what the value of their product is and they can say yes or no based on who's willing to buy in that, in that transaction. Um, unfortunately, uh, as, as a songwriter, the, and, and with our representative organizations, BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, we don't have that ability. Thank you, um, Mr. Klink. From your perspective as a producer, uh, you state that despite the indispensable role um, in the creation of sound recordings, uh, music producers uh, have never been uh, mentioned in federal copyright law, and that diminishes the ability uh, to collect royalties. Would you <clears throat> comment about that? You know, I, it's something that, uh, that the producers and engineers wing of the Academy has been working on for 10 years. You know, I, I just think it's, we play such an integral part in every song. As I said, we're fing our fingerprints are all over every song and our input is there. Uh, it was just a, such a glaring omission to me, the fact that we were not represented. We couldn't find anything to say this is what we, we already had a contract, but I wanted it put into, into law so people could look at it. We could say, this is what we deserve. We, we're not taking anything away from the artists. We're not taking anything away from the label. Uh, it just, it just makes the process for us to be able to get um, our compensation more easily, something that we can point to, something that we can say, here it is, it's written, it's into law, it's nothing nebulous, and it's not uh, anything that uh, we can't substantiate with a contract. Thank you, and I'm out of time, and I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and is pleased to recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Marino, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, <clears throat> and I apologize. My voice is headed very south. Uh, 
um, I have a cold. I'm just trying to shake it. But I just really have one point that I'd like you to uh, square my way on. If um, I chair the Subcommittee on Regulatory Reform, Commercial Law, and Antitrust, uh, and the Department of Justice consent decrees with ASCAP and BMI are of particular interest to me. Uh, do any of you, and anyone can speak up to this, uh, have a view of how these consent decrees affect creators of music and the future of these consent decrees? Anyone? Well, the, um, the consent decrees, as I understand it, of ASCAP and BMI, they're under World War II era consent decrees. So, I mean, that just seems, in this day and age, it just seems ridiculous. So anything that moves moves the rate forward is, you know, is going to be, it's just going to be a net positive for us because we're dealing in, under such antiquated laws, you know, from such a long time ago. Is there going to be equity in that moving forward? Do you see equity to where you would like to see it? Well, I mean, from a songwriter standpoint, this is the first time that we will actually have representation on the collective. So this is a huge step forward for songwriters. We're going to have two songwriters on the music collective along with the, uh, you know, everybody will be at the table, but this will be the first time that we've actually had an active voice. So it's, it's very, very positive for us. Anyone else? I, I would... I would just like to say it's always it's baffled me uh, how, um, as a membership organization, as a member of ASCAP, um, uh, there is a question of antitrust. I mean, we're not a corp, not a corporation in the same way as you know Microsoft or Google. We're a membership of colleagues, of friends who write songs, and um, and I think because we have this this gift that we use to make our living. Um, we should be able to, you know, hawk our wares as anyone on the on the uh, in a marketplace is able to. Um. And my last question is: Does radio do today in promoting what it did thirty or forty years ago? No. <laughs> in a word, no. I'm sorry. Um, no, radio doesn't. Radio, um, I don't think it exists any longer. I really don't. It's just it's all, whatever it is. I don't know what it is. It's very ethereal. Um, radio stations were created for disco. Radio stations created for rap music. Radio stations created for everything in the world Playing me, Dionne Warwick, on radio is a rarity these days, unless you're listening to 60s, 70s radio stations that were created specifically to play those particular recordings. So, as I said, in, in a word, no. Uh, largely today, um, internet or, uh, companies are being used for discovery and for for promoting music. So uh, an organization like YouTube, a company like YouTube, is where a vast majority of youth are discovering music, listening to, and streaming music. Um, their rates are smaller, are the smallest of all of the big companies, and probably of all of the companies anyway. Um, and uh, terrestrial radio is, still has relevance in, in, in many ways for breaking artists, um, depending where you're from. But it all, it all, uh, comes down to how is the copyright that's being um, distributed over the airwaves uh, <coughs> benefiting the creator? Um, and in, on all sides, you know, with these businesses that we deal with as artists, we're, we're not getting a fair deal. And it comes down to, I think, laws that, that can change, that can help us uh, actually stand in the ring and fight with a, with a chance. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. It's a pleasure discussing this with you today. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, um, thanks to all of you for being here. 
Uh, this is a really important discussion. Mr. Klink, I want to thank you for taking four members of Congress into the studio and producing a track that sounded like Guns N' Roses, mm -hmm. or at least like passable music. Um, that was a great experience. And Mr. Jones, uh, some 30 plus years ago, uh, <clears throat> my parents dropped me off at the University of Michigan and, and uh, <laughs> And I um, started. I started unpacking, mm -hmm. uh, and there was a, a radio. There was a DJ in Detroit who ended every one of his shows with Green Onion. I had never heard it before. I heard it that day and hundreds of more times throughout my days in college. Um, you weren't compensated even once for the times that he played it, but it brought enormous joy to me, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, yeah, thanks. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think this is a really important hearing. The committee's been engaged in a review of copyright music licensing for a number of years. I'm grateful uh, to the chairman for taking up this process and especially grateful that we're so near consensus on so many issues. And as we celebrate the hard work and progress, uh, it's really important to hear from a panel like this and frankly uh, to hear from a panel like this in a room full of so many people who uh, who have dedicated good parts of their lives to helping this industry succeed. Um, it's too easy for us to wade through these debates, however, without thinking about how our proposals so often impact the lives of artists and creators every single day. Uh, and I think that's because music is different. I think it's because music is personal for everyone. Uh, I, like so many others, uh, have moments that I think back to listening to a song in a car, going to a concert uh, with my family, sitting alone in a room and discovering a, a song, a songwriter, an artist, a sound that I've never heard before and finding such joy in it. Uh, and those moments where songs gave me comfort were turned around a day that I was certain would end as badly as it started, were it not for the work that you do. So that's the core of what we're talking about today and how we in Congress can improve the music ecosystem that will then touch the lives of millions of Americans and people all around the world uh, is thanks to the power of the work that the people in this room do. As the testimonies of our witnesses have shown, these are complex issues. There is a wide variety of potential improvements to the 100-year patchwork of music licensing. The question is how do we incorporate changes to keep the music ecosystem thriving for tomorrow. And I think over the past few years, we've all had moments where we considered what we would do if we were starting over, if we were designing a system from scratch. How simple it would seem to start from a blank slate here to develop a system to compensate songwriters and producers, publishers, record labels, streaming services, other key stakeholders, and to do it fairly. But we've had many conversations with people over the years and across the industry about what it would look like for them, and predictably, each often had very different answers based upon their experiences. But th this has been a really important learning process, and we realize we've got this really complex legacy system that we have to be realistic and, and frankly, surgical about as we attempt to change it. So I just wanted to, to highlight again, I'm so grateful for the effort uh, that, that led us to this moment. Um, but the issues going forward here and beyond that we just have to remember, first, maintaining a different performance rights standard for terrestrial radio than for digital competitors is just simply unfair. It's unfair, frankly, to the innovative digital services, but it's especially unfair to the performers whose music is no less valuable when played over the air. In the same vein, holding that music recorded before 1972 should be treated differently than more recent music is disrespectful to the classic artists, uh, two of whom we are blessed to have here today, who have contributed so much to America's musical legacy. It is not, February 15, 1962, Ms. Warwick, is not your, the benchmark of your value. You should never think that it is. And I'm thrilled that we're close to rectifying that. Uh, as the co-chair of the Songwriter Caucus, I have to mention how fair, unfair we have been to the songwriters. The songwriting community are nation's great storytellers who have produced and these great stories that have meant so much to us emotionally. And finally, I just want to point out that reforming the Copyright Office for the 21st century can't be forgotten. We have to have flexi flexibility and freedom for the office to fulfill its duties to creators and to the American public. Uh, I'm really grateful for this hearing and for the moment that we've reached. And I would just end by, by um, making a point I've made in committee multiple times. Um, this is a really incredible device that we all have and that through which um, 
we're able to enjoy a lot. But every one of the great technologies that has provided access to us, every new innovation that gives us ways to explore and discover uh, could not be possible without giving us the ability to discover the music that all of you have created and continue to create, and we're so grateful for it. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now get to recognize the gentleman from Texas, a man who is no stranger to a radio station presence with his experience, Mr. Farenthal. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I did start working as a DJ in radio at 15 years old, so I'm a little bit more sympathetic to terrestrial radio than uh, probably some of the folks here. Uh, we're, they're facing a lot of the same challenges uh, that you are. Their audience is moving away to uh, streaming services and satellite radio as well. And I worry from time to time what's going to happen without that local radio station when there's something like a hurricane that we had in uh, South Texas. Mm -hmm. Where are the venues now for our uh, local advertisers to, uh, mm -hmm. to affordably reach people? You know, I've, I've got a subscription to Netflix. I've got a, a subscription to a streaming uh, music service. I've done a pretty good job at avoiding all commercials. Mm -hmm. uh, if we could now just block some of, some of the pop-ups on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, but So th th there, is, th there is an issue there, and I, I, I urge you to be sympathetic. Uh, but I, I want to talk a little bit, and I'll, I'll let anybody on the panel who wants to uh, address this take it. Where, uh, you get complete sympathy from me that I believe songwriters in particular are, uh, are, are underpaid. I think the, uh, the performers, I, I, I used to say, well, get out and play some more concerts, mm -hmm. and you can, you, you, you can make some more money. But I, I want to come up with a fair solution for everybody, and I really do like some of the bills uh, that are out here. But to, let's just take me for an example. I'm, I, I've got a $120 subscription a year to a streaming music service. I've got $120 a year subscription uh, to satellite radio. Uh, I go to two or three concerts a year. I'll buy maybe five or six uh, CDs a year. Mm -hmm. And I've burned $500 a year on music. Mm -hmm. Where is this extra money going to come from? Who's making the money that we're going to redistribute here? Or am I going to end up spending six or $700 a year on my music? Yes, sir. Your, your point is so well taken, and I so identify with it. And that's why I have really wanted to emphasize today this, I keep talking about the spirit of cooperation. For us to reach a place where we are not competing, a place where we're all on the same team, where we're all creating together. I would not be here if it weren't for the radio stations that played my music and, uh, and, and they, they played it for free, and it benefited me. Yes, sir, your, your point is so well taken. We all so benefited from that. However, as I said before, it is property. And, and that's why I think that, that uh, it, it's just a matter of us getting out of the competitive frame of mind and getting into the creative frame of mind together. And that's, where, that's why I say we should, uh, the National Association of Broadcasters and the songwriters and the creators are really, really on the same team. We do the same together. You, you, those stations couldn't right. exist without these great there, records, no that, these great that, Guns N' Roses records. But the Guns N' Roses benefited from the stations playing that. Yeah, it, absolutely, it was a symbiotic relationship. Um, Ms. Warwick, I, I, I do want to address your question. I mean, you're kind of jokingly about making it retroactive, just so everybody knows. It would be an ex post facto. Joking. It would be a, well, it would be an ex post facto law to go change the rules for something that's already been done. And that, that's, that's become a dirty word, but I think I heard something of so 36 months or three years or something. You know, in the spirit of cooperation. You know. Right. And again, I think I, I think I, I think we made a huge mistake when uh, when we set it up where. Uh, where the uh, older material was not uh, covered in digital. I, I do think that's wrong, and I do think it certainly needs to be uh, fixed uh, going forward. Uh, finally, uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit, and you uh, all mentioned uh, YouTube and how little they play, but they also offer a service. If I were to want to produce a video about anything and put some music behind it, I couldn't for the life of me figure out who I needed to pay. 
the songwriters, the performers. There's no comprehensive database. Mr. Sensenbrenner has uh, introduced legislation to, uh, to fix that and is part of this ongoing uh, conversation. Does anybody uh, object to having a, a comprehensive database of who owns what so w we can legally figure out who to pay? Yeah, well, wouldn't you feel that all component parts of the music that you think that you want to play should be paid? I, I do, but how do, how, how do, if I were to say want to get one to play, play one of not your songs in a, in a video, just... how would I figure out who all who all well, to there's compensate? There's a name on who ever, ever wrote it. There's a name who ever sung it. There's a name who ever played on it. That's how. And so how do I find them? Go ahead. Part of I'm this. I'm out of time. And I'll, 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 the, uh, the, 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 no, you may answer, no, Mr. I was just going to say part of the Music Modernization Act is this collective that's going to be set up is going to become, in a sense, a clearinghouse for all songwriters and publishers. That's where this information will come from. And it, it will, uh, believe me, songwriters, if, if we knew that we had a place to go to find ourselves, we will go find ourselves. And also there's millions and millions of dollars that are, that are not being paid, that are being held by the streaming services now that this act will, will you know, it'll set up the clearinghouse so that we can finally be paid these unpaid royalties. So there, there are many, many benefits about that. I Hey, I, your question is the Music Modernization Act. It's in there. And we're trying to, to get that legislation passed so that we can have an, uh, a music licensing collective that does this work. Sound Exchange worked extremely well um, in the digital age to collect performance ro royalties for mm -hmm. um, digital streams. It's a beautiful system. Um, it was you know, something that, that has benefited me and all of the other artists and performers and even producers. Uh, so, as long as we can get this, the Music Modernization Act through, your answer, the answer to your question uh, is in there. I, I believe the ranking member has a quick question. Yes, I, I, I'd like to ask the gentleman from Texas to yield for a, quest, a quick question. Sure. Thank you. I, I appreciate your um, uh, concern for the financial viability of small radio stations. Were you aware that the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act uh, has a provision uh, limiting uh, liability uh, or responsibility under the uh, for, for payment of, uh, of of royalties for performing artists for radio stations under a million dollars revenue a year to five hundred dollars a year, and would that satisfy your concern in this respect? It, it, it's, it's certainly a, a good start. I, I do believe that, and, and again, I'm I'm generally supportive of all the legislation that we're uh, discussing here today. And it's just a matter of get the devil is always in the details. And I appreciate all the work everybody's doing on it, and want to continue to be a part of it. Thank you, and thank you. I yield back. I now uh, I now have to get to the detail of recognizing uh, the gentleman from Brooklyn, Mr. Jeffries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank um, all of the witnesses for your illuminating testimony here today. I think I'll just begin by pointing out that you know, what I think we're charged to do as members of the Judiciary Committee, uh, who have responsibility for all things constitutional, in the context of the music space, uh, is really just to bring to life, at this moment in time, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution, which is a provision designed to give Congress the power to develop and maintain a robust intellectual property system in order to promote the progress of science and useful arts. That's not my words. That's not Collins's words or anyone's words. Those were the words of the founders of this great country who recognized it was important that the creative community deserve to be able to benefit from the fruits of their labor. And in doing so, would continue to share your brilliance with the entire world. And so I would say that with all the technological changes that are in place that we're working our way through, all of these bills at the end of the day are really just designed to be consistent with a vision for this nation uh, that was uh, present at the very founding of the republic. Uh, and so with that, let me uh, start with Mr. Black. The music ecosystem includes as I understand it, songwriters, recording artists, producers, engineers, publishers, labels, among others. Is that right? Yes. The music ecosystem is, is um, many different parts. And so I understand the importance in putting forth bills and legislation that is comprehensive because from your seat, 
you see many issues, gun control, all, a lot of things you guys have to vote on um, in, in uh, Congress. When it comes to music, you want to see music as a package. You don't want to see uh, songwriters screaming in your right ear, producers screaming in your left ear, recording industry screaming at the front of you, and then the publishers behind you uh, attacking you. We are coming together to find a, a way to make legislation that is housed in one bill that works for all of us. And this is what we found. We found it in the music, the, the, the um, Music Modernization Act. Thank you. And um, Mr. Douglas, so music consumption over time has gone from, I guess, vinyl records to eight tracks, eight tracks to cassette tapes, cassette tapes to CDs, CDs to downloads, downloads uh, to streaming. And it's my understanding, I think, uh, that as of two years ago in 2016, streaming has now overtaken all other forms of music consumption. Is that right? Yes, sir. And um, you testified that our copyright law has not kept up with changes in society in the context of technology. Is that right? Yes, sir. And how has the failure of our copyright laws to keep up with these technological changes and the way in which music is consumed impacted the creative middle class, right? Not the superstars, right. uh, but the creative middle class uh, songwriters or recording artists who in the past have been able to make a middle class living by participating in this wonderful thing we call music, but appear to be threatened at this moment by being interested in your perspective on that. Yes, sir, that's a good question. The, the, I mean, that is the reality. The, the, the middle class of songwriters has, has just been eliminated, but, and, and that's frightening. But really the most frightening thing is it's the next generation of, of creators and songwriters. Those are the ones that are going to be wiped out because there won't be a viable business model for them to make a living if these changes aren't made. So, I mean, honestly, you know, we've all been very blessed in our time to, to make a living in music. The middle class is gone, but it's the next generation of, you know, the people to make great American music, um, you know, in their teens and their 20s that are going to, you know, be the next great export of America. Those, they're just going to be wiped out. My time is expiring, so I think I'll just uh, make the observation that if music, you know, has the power to bring together, you know, a conservative Republican from rural Georgia with a progressive Democrat <laughs> from Brooklyn, New York, uh, and someone on the left like Jerry Nadlin, someone on the right like Daryl Issa, we should have the power to get something done on behalf of the music community. I yield back. I guess that's not just because he's local. Uh, <laughs> and with that, the gentleman from far away, from, uh, from Georgia, who has done so much to move this agenda, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I came to Congress five years ago this month. Shortly after that, the chairman of this committee, Mr. Goodlatte, gave a speech and said he wanted to deal with copyright. And just as the clarion call went out in previous generations to do something, I took him at his word. I didn't know a lot about it at the time, but I said something's not fair here as I began to dig. I began to look at my own life and I began to look at my own uh, background and I began to look at what changed my life and the songs, the music, the motion pictures, the things, the sights and the sounds that come from the people's hearts, their minds, out their mouths, out of their hands, that touch generations is valuable. Intellectual property, in its biggest sense, brought down to words and notes. And even from an old pastor, it's that song of the Spirit. It's that, it's that constant vibration from the beginning of time that vibrates and fills what we feel every day. I took off on this trip. My staff thought me crazy many times. <laughs> And I still am, because I'm crazy about fairness. I'm crazy about what's right. And when we can find partners to do this, like my friend, Hakeem. We've been doing this a while, haven't we? 
That's right. Going from coast to coast, literally. <laughs> Seeing Aloe along the way, Tom along the way, Mike, we've seen you all. But let me tell you where we're at right now. And an amazing thing that I have now become to be more and more settled on is that what we're on the cusp of after the leadership of the chairman moving forward is that we're on the cusp of making major music history because of what we have in the bills that have been talked about today, starting with the Music Modernization Act. The Music Modernization Act is truly a defining moment because it spans really the diversity that what we have. You may have had a song, Mike, that had Welcome to the Jungle. Welcome to the Jungle of trying to negotiate these parties. <laughs> when you come along and you have the digital association, Spotify, the others that are a part of this that have been such work, and I'll lose them all, Songwriter Association, NSAIA, NMPA, BMI, ASCAP, SONA, Recording Academy, SAG-AFTRA, CMI, the Internet Association, the Copyright Alliance, RIAA, Sound Exchange, and the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. This is the tool. This is the vehicle, if you would, to make the changes that we can see forward so that this industry can change. The Classics Act can be included. The AMP Act can be included. We're looking at that. But now is the time. The hearings have brought us to the point of understanding. And I have one more little announcement to make. We've talked about this, and I made mention earlier that I was so proud that the artists and the broadcasters went and for the last year have been discussing, but they've also been discussing on this one. And over the last little bit, I'm extremely happy to announce that NAB, ASCAP, BMI have reached an agreement regarding the Music Modernization Act. The agreement resolves NAB's concern with potential introduction of new evidence in the rate setting process while preserving ASCAP's and BMI's ability to seek meaningful compensation in the growing time. I was told one time the only way you're going to get this done is find consensus. And I told everyone, and many in this room would stand up and say amen. I said, go find me consensus, we'll find a bill. And over the past year, we found consensus with the hard work of this committee and the work of the chairman. I could ask you a lot of questions. Booker, Allo, Tom, Mike. Yeah. But there's no sense in asking you questions. You've already answered them. Your life's work is what's been put out here. Your life's work of touching people is what matters. So now we have the vehicle. Now we have a bill that you've been doing so well and talking about that addresses many concerns, where you can find out who owns something, where you can find out how people can get paid, where the system now finally comes together with every party working at it. I cannot say enough about how the digital sphere and the songwriter sphere and the publisher sphere and the broadcasters have worked tirelessly on this. No one has said no. They said maybe. They said, I'll try. And the Music Modernization Act, along with my friend Hakeem Jeffries and many who have signed on already, and also with our partners, our two senator songwriters, Mr. Hatch and Mr. Alexander, along with Mr. Coons, Mr. Whitehouse, and many others, have said, now's the time. So to this community that I've testified before many times, that I've heard from and I've went and spoke to you, my heart for a kid from North Georgia, a trooper's kid who when his dad went to work, he had a radio and a TV and books. When you read, you listen, you hear your songs. The house that built me is also the house that built this message. And this bill is ready to move. And with that, all I ask is that when we come together, Mr. Chairman, let's mark this up. Let's make history. And I yield back. Here, here. You know, Reverend, I think you've topped some of your Sunday <laughs> services. Yes. And with that, we go to the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, to our witnesses, not only for the work that you have created that has 
enriched our lives and nourished our souls, but also for the work that the artists and songwriters and producers that you represent that have done that for people all over the world. So uh, I think we are all here, uh, hopefully committed to making sure that we fix this ecosystem that Mr. Deutsch spoke about and really fulfill our responsibilities that Mr. Jeffrey spoke about that are in the founding documents of this country because our founders recognize that creating a system that protects artists and art and values and fairly compensates art and art artistic creations matters to our humanity, matters to our democracy, and is our ultimate you know, serious responsibility as members of Congress. I'm really thankful of all of the work that has gone into helping craft this legislation. When I think of the incredible talent that has spent, and I'm not talking about members of Congress, I'm talking about artists and songwriters and performers that have devoted hours and hours and hours over many, many years. I and mean, when I think of what songs could have been written, what songs could have been produced, um, we're cheating the American people every day we don't get this done because we're occupying you with things uh, where you should be using your creative talent and doing that work. So. I hope that we're going to move. I hope that we're going to move these bills today in front of you. I don't know if that's our plan, but I think it'd be wonderful. Um, but but I I think this is an example, sadly, of where the kind of technology and music is changing so quickly, and Congress is a kind of slow-moving entity. And uh, I think we're we're catching up with these bills in a good way. But I'd be interested to know from any of the panelists as we think about kind of the next 10 years, the next 15 years, and I know that's hard to project, what are the likely things we should be thinking about so that we don't find ourselves 10 and 20 years behind? Because we can't afford to, to not have a system that compensates people for what they create. And this is sort of a basic, simple idea. Someone creates something, it belongs to them, they should be paid for it, and they should get to decide how it's used, who gets to hear it, when they do, and under what circumstances. And we do that with every other creation, uh, apparently, except music right now. And I think uh, that's a very basic idea that we need to uh, recognize. But, but I'm particularly interested to hear your thoughts about you know, when you look at some of the platforms where music is heard and some of the incredible dominance of just a few companies and the kind of market power that those companies have, those technology companies, is a, you know, buying, a willing buyer, willing seller, going to work in an environment where there's a lot of power on one side of the negotiating table in these instances. And are there some issues we need to be thinking about because even if we arrive at a solution, if the negotiations are really imbalanced, maybe it's still not going to result in fairness to artists and producers and songwriters. So I, I don't know. My question, my real point is thank you. I think we're all committed to getting this done. Certainly I am. But are there, I, are there issues that we should be thinking about as we look forward to prepare ourselves to be more responsive uh, as the technology and the industry changes? Well, from a songwriter standpoint, almost 100% of our income is government re regulated, which is, I can't think of another industry where that's the case. The more that we can, with all due respect, get the government out of our business and being able to take it to the marketplace, willing buyer, willing seller, just to negotiate, um, the better off we're going to be. We just want to detangle ourselves from all the regulation and just allow us to negotiate in the, in the free market just like any other kind of business. I agree, with, I agree with what Mr. Douglas is saying. I totally recognize and understand uh, the comment that you're making about the tension between really big behemoth <laughs> companies that could potentially make a willing buyer, willing seller situation impossible for a small songwriter. Um, however, I believe it should be the, the, the power in the hand of, of the creator, uh, as with every other industry. And then, in addition, to close the loopholes that protect these big companies for notice of intent uh, to, to remove, where they're using our content but not paying for it um, because of, uh, let's say, well, the uh, Digital Millennium Com Copyright Act, where they're saying that, um, yeah, we've got people uploading it and we can't control it all. Well, I don't know if I believe that, um, but if it's there, you can at least count it. And if you can count it, then you should be distributing um, the income that is made from it. Uh, one more comment is that if the money is in the hands 
of the songwriters. We will pay taxes on it. When it's in the hands of the big guys, we don't know where that tax money is going. And some of them aren't even, you know, registered in the U.S. anymore. They moved to other countries. So I would... Well, that would be a great invitation to comment on the recent Republican tax bill. I will decline. <laughs> in the spirit of bipartisanship and yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the chairs, please recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the democratization of music has never been without controversy. When FM radio first began, there were some in the creative community who were incensed that they weren't being compensated for each and every play. And several of you have acknowledged that FM radio did a lot to ensure that creative people were able to achieve great prosperity as a consequence of their creations. Why is this different? Why is, why is, why is the digitization of music in creating greater access, greater enjoyment, building bigger audiences, creating greater demand for performances. Why is that a different circumstance than the circumstance that we saw when music first went on to terrestrial radio? Payment rates. We embrace technology. This is not against technology. We love all the technological revolution that's happening, but, but we are... Uh, uh, the, the technological companies are exploiting a loophole in which they are not paying us our fair share for using our product. That's the difference. So that, that's the difference. I mean, uh, to re, you know, AM radio and FM you were radio. You paid we, on FM radio, right? I mean, what? When FM radio first began, as, as I believe was stated by Mr. Jones, FM radio was playing music for free. And well, no perform our performance income is always, and particularly in country music, performance income. When we get a song played on the radio, that's a that's a performance royalty, mm -hmm. and that's a very substantial part of a songwriter's income in, in country music, particularly. So, the your, the performance really income is not really what's in question here. It's it's the it's the mechanical digital income that really we're, we're talking about. All the distribution of music is going to streaming by 2020. There won't be any downloads and there won't be any hard CD sales. You won't even be able to buy it. It's all going to be digital. So we've got to be able to get our fair share um, You know, when, when the songs are all going to be streamed. We're, we're not being compensated, and that's what this act uh, goes to... Uh, you know, Mr. Mr. Black, you'd made mention in your earlier testimony of the legal proceedings and the limitation on the inclusion of evidence that could lead to more just outcomes. Could you enlighten me as to the type of evidence that's being excluded now that you think, if it were included in those decisions, would yield better outcomes? Yeah, the royalty rate for the master side of the recording, um, the... Uh, is, is a major part of it. Um, because the record labels who own the master recordings have had the opportunity to negotiate for a larger share of the pie of income made at the streaming company. <laughs> if the rate courts were able to see what the size of the pie was and then to consider what the value of the copyright is, master and intellectual property, underlying intellectual property, they could probably they could have the opportunity to say, well, without the underlying intellectual property, this master recording wouldn't exist. As a matter of fact, this master recording doesn't have the the same merit as the intellectual property. When I write a song, lyric and melody, I can create a hundred different master recordings off of that lyric and melody. Mm -hmm. But the lyric and melody is the undeniable morsel, the, the, the atom of, of the creation. This is, to me, the indelible value. And that's the one that uh, I, I believe, the reason why I believe the rate court should be able to see what money is being made from this atom and why it is so valuable. That is an incredibly helpful explanation. Thank you very much. And, and, and uh, the, you know, uh, your description of, uh, you know, 136 million spins for pittance is consistent with what I've heard from many others in the creative community. And uh, 
those of us who enjoy the consumption of music and would trade just about anything in our lives to continue to be able to consume music um, ought to have, I think, a greater awareness of that fact, and that's why I'm so grateful that uh, Mr. Collins and Mr. Jeffries, Mr. Issa, and Mr. Nadler have undertaken that endeavor. And I would, I would conclude by, again, highlighting the point I believe my colleague Mr. Jeffries made. Uh, th these are constitutional principles that are foundational to the United States of America, and what makes us special is that we value those who can create things that then become our great exports, but also a great sense of enjoyment and intellectual stimulation, emotional stimulation within our country. And so I'm eager and hopeful that we'll be able to have this legislation up for a mark soon, and I yield back. Chair, sure, thanks, gentlemen. It's pleased to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Liu, for five minutes. Thank you. I want to thank Chairman Goodlad and Ranking Member Nadler for holding this field hearing. It's incredibly informative. I also agree with Representative Cicilline that we should just move and pass these bills today, mostly because I'm a Democrat and I'd just be super excited to be able to vote yes on legislation this <laughs> committee. <laughs> um, and I want to thank the witnesses today. Uh, not only uh, does your work make the world a funner place, but it's an important part of our economy. Uh, my view is we compete in America emphasizing our competitor advantages. We're not going to compete making socks. I hope no one in the audience actually does that. Um, and if you look at our different sectors in the economy, we can do very well in various sectors, such as high tech or agriculture, biotech, tourism. And one of those sectors is the creative economy. And in California, where I'm from, one in 10 jobs are related to the creative economy, one of our largest exports or royalties. And it doesn't just happen. You need a legal framework uh, to protect creators and also to create incentives uh, for all of this to happen. Uh, in fact, when I was in the California State Legislature, one of my first laws I ever wrote and passed uh, allowed prosecutors to use nuisance statutes to go after people who were uh, pirating CDs at a time when people were selling CDs. And it struck me at how, as how much time has changed the ways that songs are, are being consumed. And so I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Black. You had mentioned earlier that out of over 130 million streams over four quarters, you received $2,400. If a song is downloaded, do you get a different rate? Or is, does that, does that 2400 include downloaded songs in addition to stream, streaming? Yeah, uh, downloading songs is a different rate because it, it enacts the mechanical royalty, um, the payment that is made to the record label, and then the royalty that, as an artist that I would make from the record label. But as a songwriter, the, um, the mechanical royalty only. So it's a higher rate you would get for a downloaded song than a streaming? The, the, the answer is yes. Okay. And you get a higher rate to the extent people are still buying CDs with, with your song on it, correct? Um, I think the download and the CD would be... Equal. The same rate. And as the projections show that streaming continues to get more and more of the ways of how people consume music. Yeah, the only way. It's your, your income will be very dependent solely, essentially, on streaming in the future. Is correct. that correct? So in the past, we weren't able to decide what the mechanical rate was. It was just set by the government. And in the future, we won't be able to decide Unless the MMA or some uh, legislation is passed, we won't be able to decide what the rate is. It's just going to keep dropping as, uh, as, as things uh, move further into the digital age. Great. Thank you. Um, as you sort of look at how music is changing, do you see anything beyond streaming? Or do you think that's just where we're going to end up essentially five years from now? It's really hard to, it's hard to project what the what, uh, technologists are going to create in the future, but I, I can foresee that there may be some, uh, some system that's going to come uh, later. And, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion around blockchain and how it helps to, to uh, re record a ledger of how information is distributed. I have a feeling that this could be one of the saving graces for a lot of um, uh, parts of the music industry and other uh, artists. Communities. <coughs> Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Liu. The chair is now recognizing the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, I want to just add my voice to the chorus of people saying that um, we should vote on this today. I love the idea of combining the Musical Modernization Act and the Classics Act. Um, 
and the Fair Pay, Fair Play Act into a comprehensive statutory bill of rights for uh, musical artists and um, songwriters and other people in the music industry. And we've got the power under the Constitution to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. And, and we, should, we should exercise that power because today our regime stifles musical creativity. It's driving people out of the business because they're unable to support themselves and, and to make a living. Um, I, I wanted to go back to a question that uh, Mr. Deutsch had mentioned earlier. Are there any arguments really on the other side that that artists and others involved in the creative process shouldn't be compensated? And the only one I've ever heard, uh, and I only heard it once from someone in my who came to my office, um, who said, well, music should be free. And I, I thought about it for a second. I said, you know, Housing should be free, and <laughs> utilities should be free, and groceries should be free. But as long as they're not, musicians have got to make a livelihood like everybody else. Um, so, Ms. Warwick, I, I wanted to come back to you because um, you, you had an interesting colloquy with one of our colleagues before, and I, I think it, it ended on a false note where he said that the idea of getting restitutionary payment, compensation for music uh, that was uh, made before um, 1962 should be paid today, um, that that somehow would violate the ex post facto clause. And so I, I don't know, I don't know as much about music as you do, but I do know something about the Constitution. The ex post facto clause applies only to the institution of criminal charges and penalties, new statutory offenses in the criminal field. It's got nothing to do with the civil field. And I know that robbing musicians of their fair payment has been a crime, but presumably you're not suggesting criminal punishment for the people who did this to you, right? <laughs> All right. But, but, I, I take it you're talking about getting people paid, not putting anybody in prison. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I want to I want to um, ask this question, which is that the as uh, Mr. Black suggested, this has been kind of a model coalition that's been put together to bring this cause to this point. And I do want to salute uh, Mr. Collins and Mr. Jeffries and uh, all of the members of the committee. Unfortunately, some of us just got here this year, so we can't claim any credit for it. But uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that you've been able to bring it to this point. Um, and one of the things you mentioned about your music is you're trying to raise questions of, of social justice fair payment and compensation for everybody in society, really. And I, I just want to give you the opportunity to say something about that, because uh, I wouldn't want anyone to leave with the idea that this is just a situation that affects um, either the top musicians in the country, as opposed to all musicians and people in the music industry, or just this industry, because there are lots of people across the economy who are not getting the um, fair fruits of their labors and their participation in the economy. Yes, um, very, very true. This isn't, the, the digital age is not just affecting music, it's affecting you know, the film industry, uh, photographers, visual artists, um, and there, there's a lot that can be done to, as we work forward, move forward with, with copyright, to protect their rights as well. But outside of the artist community, you know, um, I find myself with, with my colleagues at, uh, uh, in, in LA at rallies fighting for, you know, the $15 minimum wage and, and just trying to, to, to fight for a living wage for people who are at jobs where their managers are making hundreds of thousands of dollars, their the bosses and owners of the company, and the company itself is making billions, and they're just unable to to make it on a on a daily basis. Um, but they're putting their heart and and blood, sweat, and tears into into the job that they do. I think you know the purpose of the government is to protect the the weakest among us. And, um, and so, and, and we all are the government. So I don't have to be uh, a senator or a representative to exercise you know, my executive power 
of being a protector of my citizen uh, and family. Well, and I'll just close by thanking you for your excellent citizenship and activism and for expressing solidarity with people across the country who just want an economy that works for everybody. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and is pleased uh, to welcome, last but certainly not least, the newest member of the House Judiciary Committee, uh, the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Demings, who has experienced, along with her colleagues, Mr. Deutsch and Mr. Gates, about a 35-degree drop in temperature <laughs> coming, coming from Florida to New York today. So welcome. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, I just want to comment, first of all, to or make a comment to what my colleague from Maryland said. As a former police chief, I think we should reconsider those criminal penalties for people who <laughs> rob folks of what they rightfully uh, deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, the time has been uh, uh, well spent, but I do want to uh, just ask a few questions, a um, couple of questions. Um, Mr. Black, I'll start with you. In your written testimony, you said that the MMA certainly uh, won't fix all of the problems, but it is a significant step in the right direction. Uh, if you and also Mr. Douglas could just comment on what are the issues uh, that where the uh, MMA does not go quite far enough? All right, well, within, within our organizations, um, between songwriters, producers, uh, and engineers, there are other issues. When songs are uploaded to the internet, um, the distributors can, sh can distribute that music. There is a movement within our communities to get um, proper credit for the work that's being done. So Mr. Klink, who has uh, put his hand in, in many songs, will not be represented in the digital uh, uh, stream or download because the distributor didn't add his name. Now there's metadata. All of these files can hold uh, you know, a lot of information, especially just you know, a few letters, C, L, I, and K. They can hold that for sure. So um, these are the kind of things we're not, we're not gonna put all of these little issues into the MMA. Um, we'll figure this out later. Really, these are the broader strokes that matter right now. Mr. Douglas? Well, it's a, it, this is just a wonderful first step for us. I mean, it's, we realize it's a process. It has been a process, an ongoing process, but we got to crawl before we walk and walk before we want run. So this is, uh, this is crawling, but at least it, 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 you know, we've just been, we've been motionless and we've been paralyzed for such a long time. The fact that there is some movement, that, that, that's why we think this is a great first step. And once we kind of break this log jam, then we can, you know, uh, reach out and probably collect some other technologies that, uh, where there needs to be uh, that issue addressed. But that's why we think this is just a great first step. Can I say something, please? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting here and I have a tremendous amount of respect for the songwriter, the publisher. I haven't heard one word said about the recording artist, me. Mm -hmm. Not one word. And I have to address that. I'm going to take you back to my very first contract with Scepter Records, where I was getting three and a half cent royalty. We're now in an age of whatever this is called. I hate this. I am ready to throw it in the garbage every day. <laughs> I, I, I feel your pain on that one. I try to leave it everywhere I go. I really do. That and, and that thing, that computer, which has taken away the ability for songwriters and musicians to be what they're destined to be. Um... I, I, I feel that although everybody is sitting on this panel has, I mean, has said some incredible things about our industry, don't leave me out, okay? 
you know, and I, I appreciate everything that Mr. Black, Mr. Clink, Mr. Douglas, and my dear, dear friend, Mr. Jones, has said. I have two sons who are also songwriters and producers. So I understand the plight of that. However, do not forget about me as a, a, the one that brings all of that to you. Okay? That's all I have to say about that. The gentleman to yield. I yield to Mr. Nadler. Thank you. I just want to uh, comment on, on the last comment by Ms. Warwick. That is why, precisely the reasons you stated, why we have the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act and the pre-72 provisions of the Classics Act and the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, and we are not forgetting them. Okay. Thank you. And, and I'll just close by saying thank you. Thank you all for uh, what you have done to just make life better and what you continue to do. When I think about music and everybody in this room, it plays a major role in every significant thing and sometimes not so significant things. Everything that we do, music brings hope to some of the most hopeless people, children, children who are involved in the arts, for example, just do better. Yes, so thank you so very much. And Ms. Warwick, it would be damn near impossible to forget the artists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been an excellent hearing and uh, a great uh, cause that all of you have represented here today. I want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank everyone uh, who is here uh, to uh, participate in this hearing with us. I want to thank all the members from coming from uh, as far away as California and Texas and Florida uh, for uh, being here. And uh, that concludes our hearing. We've got Excellent. a lot of work to do. Let's go out and do it. Thank you. I got some magic words, though. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. The hearing is adjourned.